It's always a very special time to come and uh, share some Dhamma together. I remember when I was a young monk in <coughs> Thailand and uh, uh, you know, the time would come for the Dhamma talk and I'd always always be kind of this sense of uh, joy and anticipation, a sense that this is a kind of a special time of the day. And uh, in the kind of the evening when the... <coughs> The, uh, the day's events are over. Uh, we don't have any uh, expectations and so on. And uh, we're settling into the, uh, into the night time. And night time is very, uh, of course, very, it's a very good time for Dhamma practice. So it's my favorite time of the day is that just that disappearance of the sun, the settling down of the day and that sort of transition into the, the cool of the evening. <coughs> always, to me, feels very peaceful and uh, quite soothing. The, the kind of rhythms are quite soothing. There's a sense of uh, closure about that. And so when, when I was living in Thailand in the forest monasteries and we would usually have the, the Dhamma talk would be uh, in the late afternoon or evening time. And they come together very much like we do here uh, and very uh, just in a peaceful, simple environment and uh, just sitting there quietly sharing the Dhamma together. And uh, there's something about that... Um, there's something about it, like a sense of communion that comes from uh, hearing the Dhamma in a group. <coughs> and uh, for me, this is a very different kind of experience than I get from, say, reading the Dhamma. Reading is a very individual experience. And uh, uh, for me, uh, reading Dhamma always is, is more of a kind of an intellectual thing. So I read Dhamma books to find out information about the Dhamma or Buddhism or the Buddhist scriptures or something like that. Whereas listening to Dhamma is much more of a feeling thing. It's not so much about learning uh, a, bunch, a bunch of facts, but it's more about coming into a space where uh, something mysterious or intangible can happen. And uh, so this is one of the reasons why we don't just, you know, give a, a, a talk in a, in a, 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 a very um, sort of ugly or, or, or uh, secular kind of environment. And I often notice this when I go teaching Dhamma in places like Singapore, Malaysia and so on that, uh, you know, they don't seem to have, for some reason, they don't have much sensitivity to that. I often went, you know, my memories of being in the forest, forest monasteries in Thailand, you know, it's always kind of very low light and candle light and you're in the forest and it's, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of evocative, a very kind of romantic setting. And But then when I go to a lot of the, the Buddhist centers in... Uh, Malaysia and Singapore and Taiwan and places like that and then there's always kind of big fluorescent lights and everything's you know it's, everything's kind of artificial and plastic and uh, and all of these kinds of things and it, it's very difficult to to get the same spirit the same feeling going so we do what we can and so this is why we have we try to put up a bit of a shrine. It's why we try to do a bit of chanting together. It's why we do some meditation together. All of this is part of the whole experience because it's not just about uh, learning the content. If you want to learn the content of Buddhism these days, it's very easy. You can just go to the web and find whatever you want. And anybody can learn uh, the facts about Buddhism. <clears throat> but... Dharma isn't something that happens through facts. Dharma is something that happens um, uh, kind of like in between things. And 
there's this kind of interesting quality of the Dhamma that the, the Buddha said. Uh, the Buddha said something like, um, uh, "I don't, I don't conflict with the world. The world might conflict with me, but I don't conflict with the world." Yeah, and uh, so this has that has a very beautiful meaning, a very kind of profound meaning. When we're following the way of the Dhamma, actually, that that Dhamma itself doesn't doesn't contradict or doesn't conflict with anything. Okay? How we interpret it maybe does, or how, how we bump up against uh, various structures in the world. It reminds me of, there's a saying by Niels Bohr, the great physicist, he said that a, um, the opposite of a um, trivial truth is a falsehood, but the opposite of a profound truth is another profound truth. Yeah? So I think that's a very beautiful saying, and very much is is what the nature of the Dhamma is as well. Because when, it, when we we can say something in the Dhamma, and uh, very often the opposite of that thing might also be just as true from a different perspective. So, you know, when we come here in this kind of um, group. There's something very special about it, and something that I always always kind of reflect on. Um, that uh, uh, you know how rare it is to find people, human beings these days, who not just these days, I think at any time, who could have gathered together and associate with this kind of very pure uh, intention. And just the intention to listen to Dhamma, to purify their minds. And sometimes we get uh, frustrated, we get disappointed, we think that our meditation should be better than it is. And it's actually, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but it's actually quite a, uh, a, a, a challenging question if somebody asks you, you know, how's your meditation? Right? And, and every, almost everybody goes, well, you know, oh, not very good, or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's quite... There's very few people that you meet that you ask, how's your meditation? They say, fantastic, yeah, wow. Yeah? It's actually kind of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great struggle. And so, you know, we understand this, it can, um, it's, it's quite, um, it's easy to be down in our souls because of that. <clears throat> I remember one story when uh, there was some, some of the monks were newly ordained, there was one English monk, he's now one of the senior Ajans in Amawati, and and uh, when he was just newly ordained, Ajahn, it was at Ajahn Chah's monastery. And Ajahn Chah, of course, is a very powerful teacher. And Ajahn, he just sort of got up. And sometimes he would do this kind of thing where he would get up from his seat at the head of the line of the monks. And he would just slowly walk down the line, sort of pacing very slowly past each one as they were sitting there. And all the monks sitting there thinking, don't stop in front of me, don't stop in front of me, don't stop in front of me. And he keeps going... <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's, everyone's getting a bit nervous and then he stopped in front of this newly ordained English monk and he's sitting there thinking oh god what's going to happen now and, and he just he, Adam Charger said to him have you ever known a single moment's peace in your entire life it's quite a challenging question isn't it yeah yeah. You have to really think about it. You think, have I really known a moment's peace? And then you, you start to reflect, well, what is, what is that peace, actually? Yeah? I mean, we've known relative peace, so of course we have more times when we're more agitated and more peaceful. But if someone like Ajahn Chah asks that question, what does he mean when he's talking about having a peace, peace of mind? And then you start to get a bit worried. Yeah? Oh, God. And, and you start to think, it's quite... It's quite shocking, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite shocking to think that we can we can grow up, become mature adults, go we can have a career and get our PhDs or whatever we've got and do all our things, raise a family, we can all those stuff, and actually we've never known a moment's peace, or maybe we have, but we have to think about it before we before we can be sure. So this is quite challenging, and so it's very, it's very uh, part of the way that Buddhism is structured, 
is that we, we, we orientate ourselves around an image of perfection, yeah? i.e. the Buddha. Yeah? And the Buddha is not easy to live up to. Yeah? And uh, so sometimes it can be a bit of a problem. It's interesting that just in Indonesia, and we went to visit Borobudur, it's a completely amazing monument. It's the most, most, by far the most amazing monument I've ever seen. And uh, kind of structured like a mandala, and you 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 kind of enter into the the bottom sections of it, and you walk around these corridors, and these are very quite narrow corridors. And as you walk around, they tell stories. In the bottom level, the stories are telling very simple Buddhist tales. You know, like you make an act of generosity, and then you go to heaven, or you do something bad, or you go to hell, or something like that. And they're very very uh, straightforward tales. And you have to keep on going around to read the stories. So you have to keep on going around and around. And as you go around and then climb up the different levels, the stories gradually get more sophisticated. So then you have like the life of the Buddha and other kinds of things. And the, the Dhamma becomes more profound as you go higher and higher until eventually you come out of all these corridors and you come out at the top. And there's this incredible kind of open platform with all these beautiful stupas on there. And uh, instead of having all the, the, the like human iconography, you, you have uh, much more kind of abstract forms, yeah? And so it's kind of representing the, the plane of enlightenment or a high level of realization. And so you actually, uh, it's qu quite stunning, you know, because you actually experience that whole kind of that feeling for the whole Buddhist path just through, just through walking around that place. And... Uh, uh, One of the things that that teaches you is how, in Buddhist culture, they you know the the that dhamma is is relativized so that it's so that you know you you start out with the very simple things and gradually kind of work your way up, and there's this harmony between all those different aspects. They're kind of all brought together in that one that one form. So that was kind of that was quite beautiful. And so, one of the aspects of dhamma is that there's something for everybody. And even just trying is like really good, yeah. And uh, I know of one monk, uh, or I heard of one monk in the south of Thailand. I never met him myself. His name is Lumpur Suong. I think it's Suong. And uh, he's one of these incredibly annoying people who just sort of started meditating late in life and then just got enlightened almost straight away. And uh, had all these kind of psychic powers and stuff like that. And, you know, and he was very, very accomplished as a meditator, you know, extremely out there. And, uh, and he, but he would say, uh, so I heard that he would say that, that uh, you know, he himself had this tremendous respect for anybody who even just sat down and tried to meditate. Even regardless of what your meditation is actually like, yeah. But just the act of sitting down there and thinking, right, I'm going to meditate. Yeah? Even that is like extremely wholesome karma, because you have that intention to purify your mind. You have the intention to let go, the intention to realize nibbana, and that intention is very, very powerful. So sometimes, if we're reluctant to meditate, you know, we we sound, we, we we have these very high standards, you know. And uh, this is one of the problems sometimes if we've been on a meditation retreat. We go on retreat, we practice really intensively for a while, and then we have quite, you know, quite clear states of mind. And then we come off retreat and we get, you know, mind goes back to its ordinary old rubbish. And it's, <laughs> you kind of get very dis disappointed by that, yeah? disillusioned. And so it's hard to keep going. But you have to keep on reminding yourself of this, even that intention. Yeah? So just, you know, even if you think to yourself, I'll just meditate for one minute, that's all right. It's still good. One minute is still good. You can sit down and meditate. And then sometimes you might think, I'll meditate for one minute, but then, well, actually, you, you missed the clock and you actually meditated for a minute and a half instead, you know. So that's good. Even one mindful breath is good. Yeah? Even, even just one moment where we're actually coming back into our mindfulness and coming back into our body and getting contact with reality. Even that much is good. Yeah? 
And we can do that. We can do that right now. Yeah, we're all sitting here together, sharing the Dhamma together. Where's your, where's your mind right now? Yeah. Can you feel, what's, what does the chair feel like? Is that comfortable or uncomfortable? How does the air feel? Is it cool or warm? What kind of emotions are you feeling right now? Are you feeling um, bored or excited or uh, angry or whatever? And somehow we can get in touch with those, even as we're here. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can label it. Sometimes we know what it is. Sometimes we can't. But but you can know that as well. You can know confusion or unknowing, yeah, or ambiguity. You can know that as well. And this is what the Buddha was pointing to when he talked about mindfulness, and especially the quality of sampajanya, of what you call clear comprehension. And clear comprehension is like an all-round knowing. Okay? I mentioned before in the introduction to the talk, mindfulness has the meaning of, of like recollection in the sense of recollecting oneself. Yeah? So you're bringing yourself together and sustaining your, your awareness, bringing it back onto your meditation object and keeping it there. Whereas Sampajanya has a sense of understanding what the context is, understanding what the environment is. Okay? Knowing what you're doing, and uh, for me, the the answer, the the distinction between those two was brought out for me very clearly, and in a very impressive way, uh, straight after my first ever retreat. And I did my retreat in Wat Rampung in 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 Chiang Mai, and uh, after I did the retreat, there was a little bit of work in the monastery. They were demolishing one of the huts, it's a wooden hut, and they asked us to help move some of the wood from the building site and so I went to give a hand and uh, of course being in Thailand we were just wearing thongs and uh, I remember thinking to myself I was just about to step on the building site I've just finished my retreat 26 day retreat or 27 day or something really intensive retreat had really good meditation was feeling amazing really bright and clear and really strong and you know I've never and, and now I was trying to reintegrate this now I was trying to bring that back and say, okay, I can do stuff with this sense of awareness. So this was my first attempt. And right, I'm just about to step into the building site and I'm reminding myself, be mindful. Okay? Absolutely, be mindful. And so there's my, my foot's going up, over, into the building site, and onto a nail. Straight away. <laughs> first step. I knew it. I knew my foot was coming up, it's going along. <laughs> Onto the nail. Absolutely. Mindfulness was 100%. <laughs> Mindful of, ow, oh, bloody hell, oh, what's going on? And uh, so, so this is the difference between mindfulness, sat, we call in Pali we call sati, and what we call in Pali Sampajanya is clear comprehension. It's like this kind of all-round knowing because I didn't have that, or I didn't understand what I was doing. I didn't have an idea of the context. My, my, my awareness was too narrow. And so that's where you learn that there's different kinds of awareness that are useful for different kinds of things. Yeah? There's a, one kind of awareness that's useful if you want to sit down and watch your breath and you focus at your very, very, very precise, very clear, very single-minded focus right on that one thing and just keep it there. That's appropriate in that context. It's not appropriate if you're driving your car. Don't do it if you're driving your car. Very, very bad. Yeah, Wrong mindfulness. Very dangerous. And uh, uh, so we have to, this, is, this is your wisdom. So your wisdom is the faculty that tells you the, the difference between these things and tells you when you should apply one and when you should apply the other. So... <coughs> So our uh, opportunity to listen to Dhamma that we have tonight, right, in, in this moment, that involves a particular kind of awareness, okay? And so, you know, we develop a mind that learns how to listen to Dhamma. And uh, the Buddha mentioned that there are certain qualities that are useful for that and certain qualities that are obstructive. And some of the qualities that are useful for that, of course, is uh, having a mind which is peaceful, having a mind which is not uh, drowsy or sleepy, having a mind which uh, is 
uh, focusing and paying attention to what is said. And, uh, and then there are certain things which um, are obstructive to that. And one of the things that, one of the things it mentions that it's obstructive is having what is the Buddha calls uparambha chitta, yeah, randha gavesi, where it means a fault finding mind, yeah. So if you're listening to dhamma with a very negative mind, yeah, very cynical and fault finding, then you'll never have the joy to be able to really understand it on a deep level. Okay, so that doesn't mean that you just listen to it with just kind of blindly and just sort of accepting everything that's being said. There's a difference between having a sense of discernment, yeah, which knows what's right and wrong, and having a fault-finding mind, which is just really negative and always trying to find what's wrong. Yeah? And uh, that attitude is always expressed very well in the, in the Buddhist suttas when it talks about these things. And it has this very lovely phrase, for example, if, if uh, say, somebody goes and listens, say, maybe one of the monks might go and, and, and go to the, the, the Jain ascetics or something like that and they hear them having a discussion. And uh, they hear what they have to say and then it has this phrase, neither accepting nor rejecting. Yeah? So neither accepting nor rejecting what they say. They think, oh, maybe I need to ask the Buddha about this. I, I don't understand what this is being said. Neither accepting nor rejecting, but I'll go to the Buddha and ask him. Uh, and uh, so that's a very beautiful state of mind to be in, yeah? That state of poise, neither accepting nor rejecting. And uh, it's, in the, it's from that state of mind that real wisdom is going to come, yeah? Neither the mind that just blindly accepts everything that's being said, nor the mind that's being cynical and negative and rejecting what's being said, but the mind that's poised and open, yeah? And which listens with a sense of a sense of interest and a sense of see, it's more it's more important to care about it than it than it is to um, uh, agree or disagree or have a particular idea or something. Yeah? When we're listening to Dhamma, the most important thing is that we care about it. Yeah, it's 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 meaningful for us. If it's something which is meaningful for us, then it will have that kind of impact. It will have uh, it will have an effect. We can have all the right opinions that we like, yeah, and that's in and of itself that's good. But it doesn't get us very far if it's not uh, if it doesn't have a sense of urgency about it. And this is <coughs> one of the problems sometimes with uh, traditional Buddhist education and uh, in, in traditional Buddhist cultures where you're, you're teaching Buddhist courses in universities and things like that. And, you know, it just becomes like another subject. You just learn it so that you can master the facts and get your exam. Yeah? And so I saw in the, in the news some time ago there was this... Um, uh, someone was complaining that because in one of the Thai monks was writing an article complaining because all the monks were cheating in their Dhamma exams in Thailand. Yeah? <laughs> and this is kind of, kind of funny on a number of different levels. Not only is you know, the idea that the monks are just cheating for the Dhamma exams is inherently a bit kind of silly, but one of the other things that they, they said that, that, that also was a problem was that the, the, the monks who were the teachers were helping their students to cheat. Okay? And sometimes they'd even like write the answers on the board yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so that all their students would pass, so that you, they'd have, everyone would think, oh, they're doing very well. And no one cared about it. Yeah? And so this is really kind of that sign of the decadence of that educational system. And the worst thing about it is, right, Really, the worst thing about it is, it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah? But that's the worst thing about it. If you're a doctor and you don't study for your exams and you, you cheat in your exams, well, you've got a patient in front of you, they're going to die. Yeah? If you're an engineer, you don't learn yourself, the bridge is going to fall down. Yeah? But for the monks in Thailand, they're not really expected to really know much about Dhamma. Yeah, they, they they go and they, you do the rituals and you know you do do what you're doing, but but actually having a vocation to have a meaningful and profound understanding of dharma is not is not a part of that. It's not a part of what it means to be a monk. So it's very much just a matter of getting the uh, exams done and uh, so that you you can uh, have the various qualifications or titles or something like that. So this is this is where dharma education declines to 
when it doesn't have that sense of meaning about it, when it doesn't have that spirit to it. Yeah? And so this is again that point I was making at the beginning that it's not, it's not the facts that we learn in the Dharma which is really important. It's the meaning of it. It's whether we care about it. It's whether we have that spirit about it. Yeah? This is a really important thing. And of course the Buddha said in the, in the Dhammapada that you know, it's better to have, rather than a thousand useless words that don't mean anything, it's better to have that one word of Dhamma hearing which it brings peace to the heart. Yeah? So this is, that's, that's the real Dhamma, that's the real essence of the Dhamma. Just that one word that brings peace to your heart. You know, so, so what is it? I, you know, when I think I've been studying Dhamma for so long, you know, I have these kind of favorite Dhamma verses that mean something to me. You know, like one of my favorite verses, we were t talking about this today, my favorite verses in the Dhammapada says, um, this, is, this is a really good one for, for people who, who are into the whole happiness thing because there's this beautiful verse in the Dhammapada It says, what is laughter, what is joy when the world is ever burning? Shrouded in darkness, would you not seek the light? Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. That's one of my favorite verses. And there's another one. Asang hirang asang kupang yasanati upamakwachi adha gamisami nametakang ka evang mang dhare hiadhimuta chitandi. Which means um, the invincible, the unshakable, that. Uh, to which there is no comparison. Yeah? For sure, I will go there. I have no doubt about that. You may bear me in mind as one whose mind is made up. That's good, isn't it? Yeah? So that's a really kind of rousing one. I really like that. So sometimes, you know, you don't need yeah, all of, all of the, the, uh, 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 the philosophies and all the kind of complicated things, but those very, very simple things can... Uh, cut through to the heart of the matter, yeah? And you can bear that in mind. So it's very interesting that sometimes you, you can have this experience. This has happened to me many times in my life, that, you know, sometimes you, you um, think that, you know, you think that you know what the Dharma is. You think you've kind of read all the books and you know all the kind of stuff. And then you, maybe you're in some situation where, you're, you know, you're in stress or, you know, you get upset by something. And then you can talk to somebody about it, and then sometimes they can just say one simple thing. And you know that. It's obvious. It's very simple. Yeah? But when they say that, if someone has that sensitivity to understand where you are and to say that, then that just brings so much peace to your heart, just to be reminded of that. Yeah? Not because of learning something, but just to be reminded of what you need to know when you need to know it. This has happened to me so many times. And, uh, and understanding the Dhamma, the Buddha said that there are these two, um, uh, two aspects which he called Yoniso Manasikara is one aspect and the other aspect is uh, Parato Ghosa, Yoniso Manasikara meaning um, wise attention. That means what does Yonasa Manasikara mean? Mm. It means uh, actually treating the Dhamma, taking the Dhamma seriously. That's what it means. It means taking the Dhamma seriously. It means treating it sincerely, that it actually means something and applying it to yourself. This is what it means. And the other thing, the other aspect is Parato Ghosa, which is the, the voice of another. Yeah? So this is being able to listen to what somebody else is saying. This is one of the interesting things about the Dhamma is that it doesn't, re it's, not, it's not reductive in that way. Okay? It's not the case that in the Dhamma you can just solve everything just by meditation. Right? That's not the case. And sometimes we, we, we uh, take it to an extreme and we think that uh, we can just kind of isolate ourselves and solve all our problems like that. And if we have a problem, then it, we just have to go and meditate and we'll be able to solve it. And this has happened, and this has happened, you know, I've seen this happening in myself, this tendency in myself, and also in other people, certainly within a monastic context, that sometimes if, you're, if you question something or if you think something's wrong within that particular system or the monastery or the community or something like that, then, then it's your fault, right? <laughs> and And... The externals and the form and everything is right and you're wrong. 
then it's up to you to go and meditate and get rid of your defilements. And when you've done that, then uh, you'll see that things were all right. Yeah. Anyway, and of course, sometimes that's true. Yeah. Of course, sometimes it's true. But sometimes it's not, and those that, that's not going to solve a lot of problems. And, and it can be quite, um, it can be quite damaging, actually. Yeah. And this is something that's been quite a, um, <clears throat> quite an issue for us. At, at Santi Monastery, especially with the, the role of women in the monastery, because of course most place where the women practitioners go, they feel very disempowered. And I was just speaking with my friend, uh, Sister Pema, has just come back from Thailand. And she said she had a very, very wonderful time in Thailand, stayed at a lot of the forest monasteries and had a really, really lovely time there. Uh, and, uh, but of course, you know, in the forest monastery, because she's a Tibetan nun, right? So you, you, you know, you're like, you know, from the planet Zog, right? You're kind of descended completely, you're an Australian Tibetan, you're completely alien, kind of in this kind of alien world. And uh, so, of course, everyone's very nice to you in that, but you don't have any place, you know, on a personal level, everyone's, everyone's very, very friendly, very kind, very helpful, all of those things, but you don't have any place within the society, yeah? People, there's no, people don't have a, have a, um, they don't have a, a, a model or a, a, an example by which to relate to you. And so she said that then she went to stay with Dhammananda Bhikkhuni at her place in, near Bangkok. And she just felt how really nice that was because it was a very engaging community and, and Dhammananda is quite um, strong on engaged Buddhism and bringing the community together. So there was you know, a feeling of participation. And she just made this, this kind of interesting remark that you, know, you can't feel like a, a zero forever. Yeah? You can't just feel like you're you're nothing. You, you just can't keep on doing that. You know there has to be at a certain time there has to be a feeling of relationship, a feeling of belonging, a feeling like being a part of something. Yeah. And so this is, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to notice that. Yeah. So this is one of the things we try to build in a monastic community: a feeling of um, family. We're all here together to argue with each other, and it's all right, you know, and uh, uh, and our practice kind of depends on each other, and, and it's quite amazing because that, that kind of that idea of interdependence, interrelationship is actually very, very, um, you know, it's so, it's so kind of real in a, in a, in a uh, the more, the more, um, the more you look into it, the further down you go into it, you, the more you realize this, this is actually how the world is constructed, right from uh, a quantum level on up. You know, even in, in quantum mechanics, you, know, you can't sort of isolate a particular particle or something like that and say that that exists in a sense by itself. It only exists in relationship. And, uh, and the same thing with us as human beings. We can, only we can only meditate because we've heard the word meditation. Yeah? This is kind of what I was trying to suggest earlier when doing the introduction to the, to the guided meditation, that the words we hear when we're talking about meditation, they, they condition what we actually do. Yeah? We, we think we're, we're doing meditation, we're sitting down, we're trying to do something. And we can only do that because we've got an example. We've got a, 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 a physical example. We've seen people meditating. Yeah? We know that's what you're supposed to look like when you meditate. Yeah? So you can mimic, yeah. You can imitate somebody's example, and then you've got an idea. It's supposed to be about peace of mind and all of these kinds of things. And so, you can you can try to to experiment. So meditation is just this kind of ongoing experiment to try to see, you know, to understand what's going on, abandon what's bad, develop what's good, recognize what these things are, keep learning from your mistakes, and keep on going, keep on going, keep on going, and trying to kind of orientate ourselves. But it's something that's interesting that I've, I've noticed in, in Buddhist community is that not many people um, learn meditation or start meditating by reading books about meditation. Yeah? And it's something that really struck me when I first started teaching meditation. I was in Malaysia a few years ago. And uh, you know the people there, they have, in Malaysia, they have a lot of uh, very good free distribution Dhamma books. So they've all got the books by Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Mahabur and Mahasi Saida and all, so on and all these great meditation masters. And, but they don't meditate, right? And, uh, and then I'd come along 
right? And say, okay, let's have a meditation. And so, and then everyone would come, and then they'd meditate, and they'd sit with me, and they'd listen to me telling them how to meditate, right? And I'd say, do this, you know, do metta or do breath meditation. And they go off and they do it. And I, I'm thinking, like, why are they listening to my meditation instructions instead of listening to Ajahn Chah's, yeah? Or whoever it may be. And uh, I, I found this very curious, yeah? And, uh, but, there's, but there's something to that, that the medita- learning the meditation is not just getting the information about meditation, yeah? So the books give us a certain dimension, a certain help on that, but it's fairly limited. But it's actually having a community, and I'm sure you've, you've all known that. It's very hard to, to develop the meditation practice by yourself. Yeah? That's why everyone likes having sitting groups, and you sort of come together and you join and, and you make yourself sit. Okay, right? We're going to sit here for an hour, and then we're going to get up. And uh, it's like in the monastery just the other week we had the Waisak and we decided okay we'll sit from 7 till 12 yeah and um, that's quite a long sit yeah and uh, you know you don't normally do that right you don't normally th- sit down and think right I'm just going to sit here for five hours right and Lauren came down and joined in sat through to midnight and then drove back to Sydney and uh, because we did, you have that, that kind of group uh, energy, that group dynamic, which actually uh, supports that. Yeah? So this is the, um, the importance of community. So Buddhism, uh, sometimes when Buddhism is introduced in the West, we, we, we emphasize very much uh, the, the sort of uh, individual side of Buddhism. And Buddhism sort of has, um, in a way evolved out of quite a narcissistic uh, culture in, in the way Buddhism's evolved in the West. Like essentially, it's essentially come from the kind of the hippie counterculture movement in the 60s. And then that generation was the first group who started doing meditation and teaching and learning how to do it and then later on teaching and so on. <clears throat> and, uh, and there's a very strong kind of narcissistic kind of self aspect to that whole movement. It's not the whole whole side of it but that's part of it and uh, so it's very important uh, to remind ourselves that uh, things happen within a group that will never happen when we're by ourselves okay and so and we can't replace one with the other you can't replace individual practice with group stuff you do in a group and you can't replace the stuff you do in a group with individual practice they both work with the mind in quite different ways yeah and you can see that, you can know that, that, that people can, you know, this is very, very clear that people can meditate, for example, for many years and become very, very good meditators, yeah, and still have like blind spots or, or conditioning uh, regarding, say, cultural things or, you know, uh, preferences or whatever, ways of being with people uh, that still won't change no matter how much they might meditate. And so there's certain kinds of things that can never be solved with meditation. That's why the Eightfold Path has eight factors. Yeah? It doesn't just have one factor. If meditation was going to solve everything, we'd say the one fact, the one-fold path is meditation. But the Buddha didn't teach the one-fold path, the eight-fold path. And right speech is part of that. Okay? So this is what we're practicing here. We're practicing right speech. And, uh, of course... I'm I'm here I'm here to teach the Dhamma, right? So I'm doing half of right speech, which is the, the talking half. The other half is the listening half. Yeah. So that's also part of right speech as well. So this is what you guys are practicing. And that is an essential aspect of enabling us to realise the Dhamma. So so that's really just the, the point that I wanted to, to make in the talk tonight, is just to appreciate um, the value of these different aspects of our Dhamma path. Yes, meditation is vital and very important, but also, yes, uh, listening to Dhamma, reading Dhamma books, all of these kinds of things are also in, just as important. Learning how to relate to people and be with people in a, in a, in a Dhammic way 
with the sense of openness and clarity and compassion. This is also very important. And uh, we can't, we need to use, it's our discernment, it's our wisdom which knows what's appropriate in a particular context. Yeah? How do we use it? We know, we know we should be mindful, but how do we be mindful? How do we apply mindfulness in this particular context? That's how our wisdom which tells us this.